Greetings, salam, shakomako. How are you, dear listeners? Podcasting from the old railway depot in Swamp Poodle, Washington, D.C., welcome to Iraq Matters, an epic podcast of news, ideas, and conversations about Iraq and about people who have Iraq in their story. From the Code of Hammurabi to recent political developments, we believe that Iraq matters, and we're passionately interested in matters of Iraq. We also believe in the importance of raising awareness about the humanitarian crisis of our generation, the plight of millions of Iraqis who remain displaced, alongside millions of Syrians fleeing internal violence. I'm Eric Gustafson with Iraq Matters. Thank you for joining us as we grow a community of support for humanitarian action and peace. Hello, I'm Shana Zwais with Iraq Matters. This week, our focus is on higher education in Iraq and the story of American University of Iraq, Sulaimani, AUIS, a student-centered American-style university established in 2007. This week's program includes a conversation with our executive director, Eric, who recently traveled to the Kurdistan region of Iraq. He reports on progress with our current fieldwork, Photo Voice Iraq, and on his visits to three Syrian refugee camps. An interview with our special guest, Kyle Long of AUIS, American University of Iraq, Sulaimani. Also from AUIS, Professor Bilal Wahab joins us to tell us about his experience teaching at this prestigious university. But first, a campaign update. Our campaign to put Iraq back on the agenda continues. Our petition on change.org now has the support of 4,500 signers. Our goal is to reach 10,000 signatures. That's where you come in. As you listen to this podcast, please take a minute to invite your family and friends to support our campaign by sharing the link iraqmatters.org. That link, iraqmatters.org, redirects our petition page on change.org where you can sign the petition and also find useful social media sharing tools. Today is Thursday, September 26. Earlier this week, President Barack Obama addressed the UN General Assembly. In his address, he stated, Iraq shows us that democracy cannot be imposed by force. Rather, these objectives are best achieved when we partner with the international community and with the countries and people of the region. We agree with President Obama, and we'd like to offer Syria as another important example. An example of what happens when the U.S. and the international community fail to effectively partner with the countries and the people of the region to reduce conflict and support the democratic aspirations of a population. That support is important during times of transition, conflict, and humanitarian emergencies. It has been 654 days since President Obama last met with Iraq's Prime Minister, or made any public statement about an ongoing U.S. commitment to the people of Iraq. Join us in urging the Obama administration and Congress to do more to support renewed diplomacy and humanitarian action for peace in Iraq. Now here's our interview with Eric on his recent trip. Hello, my name is Shanaz, and I'm here with Mary, and we will be interviewing Eric, our executive director, who recently came back from his trip to the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, welcome back, Eric. It's good to be back. I am so jealous that you <laughs> got a chance to visit my hometown, Sleimani. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful city. It's um, For our listeners who have never been there, it's in a valley surrounded by mountains. It's, um, I think, one of the... Uh, intellectual hearts, literary heartlands of the Kurdistan region. So it's a it's an important city, and it's um, I always enjoy visiting there. Definitely, and it's uh, definitely a great place for our latest project, the Photo Voice. Um, can you tell us more about Photo Voice, um, how it started, and what it is? Sure. Just as a background, uh, Photo Voice Iraq was a project that we crowdfunded last year, and we're really excited to get that project started now. The, the idea is, first of all, it's a, it's a research methodology that was developed years ago. Um, it's uh, at the very beginning, I think um, individuals like uh, Pablo Freire mm -hmm. were involved in this whole movement. But the idea was that you had researchers who would research uh, communities and 
the individuals that they were researching ended up being the subject and the researcher. It creates this, this hierarchy. The idea of photo voice is to actually involve those who you're researching in conducting the research itself. So it's a very empowering methodology. And in this case, what we want to do is work with young people and have them use cameras to answer three questions. Uh, what did they see as, one of, as the most important issue of their times affecting them and people they care about? Uh, what positive change do they want to see within their lifetime? And how do they hope to be a part of that change? And I think the, the results will be interesting to see how young people in Iraq today are perceiving their future prospects, their opportunities, what they see as the most important issue of the times, um, what, what kind of positive change do they want to see within their lifetime and how do they want to be a part of it. Um, so that's the idea of photo voice. And for us, uh, because we're just now starting to do field work in Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, focused on young people, focused on peace building, um, for us, it's an opportunity to learn more directly from youth so that we can develop programs that better serve their needs. So tell us, uh, what, what are the steps that you took during your visit to Iraq to uh, advance this new project? Well, it was actually really good to be there because there were so many things that need to happen in order for our program to be successful. So one of the important things that I did is had an opportunity to meet with some government officials because we're keenly interested in having EPIC officially registered with the Kurdistan Regional Government, which will allow us to work more closely with ministries and even in the public schools. Because we're looking to make this project happen quickly. Um, we went forward to start meeting with private schools and universities because we can pilot the project initially with one of the private schools. And in Erbil, I met with a number of schools that were very impressive. Cambridge International School, Ishik College for Boys and College for Girls, the American School, I talked with the headmaster there. But shifting to the city of Sulaymaniyya, the meeting with American University of Iraq uh, Sulaimani, I was just so impressed. They clearly are playing the role of being a leader in higher education in Iraq. Um, had excellent meetings with faculty there and decided that really AUIS is going to be the best home for piloting Photo Voice. Uh, what did you do on your visit to AUIS? What steps did you take working with AUIS? We're fortunate to have a member of our board of directors, Bilal Wahab, who was just interviewed in our previous podcast. He's truly exceptional, very active at the university. And then we also have a lot of relationships with others that we've gotten to know over time. So the, there's an institute there called the Institute of Regional and International Studies, IRIS. Um, so I had a chance to meet with uh, Marianne Aboud, um, who's the director for that institute. I've already had a chance to talk and meet with Kyle Long, um, who is head of their external relations. So all of that has kind of facilitated this process, and we're now going to be talking with AUIS just this week to start to get into the details of how the project will be implemented. We'll be heading back to Iraq on October 3rd um, to go directly to AUIS and then begin training the mentors and meeting with the youth participants. So everything is now, the stage is now set for us to successfully execute the project. Tell me about the, the mentors, where will we draw from to find these mentors to work with the youth? Well, our goal is hopefully most of the mentors will actually be educators, professors, teachers, assistants that are right there at AUIS because part of the benefit of Photo Voice is not just what it does for the youth participants, but it will also, I think, open doors of understanding for the educators to better understand the students they're teaching. Photo Voice is a very student-centered process which of course is different from I think the traditional approach to education that tends to be very teacher directed. So this is a student centered process and I think they'll learn a lot about their students, they'll learn a lot about what their aspirations are, what they hope to be able to do with their lives and we hope that will then set the stage for longer term mentoring relationships between these professors and uh, faculty and their students. It's a really exciting time to be in the EPIC office and be working on this new project. So. Um, let, let me also ask you about uh, the rest of your trip in Iraq. I know you mentioned to me earlier that you met a lot of uh, great organizations that were also uh, doing great work. Um, how else did you spend your time when you were in Iraq? 
Well, anytime that I go, it's so important for me to get a better understanding of what is happening on the ground, to talk with as many people as possible, to also visit, you know, right now there's a huge crisis of Syrian refugees. So an opportunity to visit some of the refugee camps to better assess the humanitarian response to um, the needs of those refugees who are arriving. I mean, I arrived in Iraq, you know, just a few weeks ago. And when I arrived, just a few weeks prior to that, more than 50,000 Syrian refugees had just entered into the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, I went to Domiz camp, which is uh, one of the more established refugee camps. There's over 80,000 refugees have been registered there. When I was there, there were at least over 60,000 residents still there in the tents. I went to Baherke and Kawagask camps, which are in Erbil. And these are camps that are newly established and handling this recent influx. I think at Kawagask alone, there had just been over a thousand refugees had just recently arrived. And uh, what are the conditions that you saw in the camp when you were there? So with Domi's camp in Dohuk, that camp was established in March 2012. And initially, there were only a few thousand, no more than 10,000 initially. That number has mushroomed upward. And so when I was there, like I said, it's a much larger number. But the camp has been there for so long that it's become more established. It's actually quite organized. There's still, I think, some disparities, especially between the um, established portions of the camp where you have families versus the uh, areas where you have the singles, young single men. So there's still some issues trying to get the sanitation and everything up to where it needs to be. The big issue it also has to do with education. Half the residents there are young people, 17 and younger, um, you know, school age. And there's only three schools right now, but organizations like Harakara, a local agency, they've assessed that there actually needs to be seven to eight schools to handle the school age population. So clearly the demand is not being met. And it's even more serious of an issue because, you know, I went to these camps, that's only half the Syrian refugees. The other half of the refugees are in the urban centers. And in those situations where there's children, uh, they aren't necessarily able to access schools because you have to have documents to be able to access the schools. So there still needs to be a way to address the needs of those young people to make sure that they're also able to get into school. So Demise has is more established, it's been around longer. Well, how does this contrast to the, to the other camps like Baharke that you also visited? Well, so Baharke has over 4,400 individuals at that camp. Again, it's very, very new. It's only been around for, I think, a couple months. There's a warehouse. And, you know, what I saw was it felt a bit more chaotic. The tents aren't as fortified, so it's not a camp that's winterized. And then there's a warehouse and you have that petitioned up and a lot of families that are living in the warehouse. So you can imagine when the winter comes, they're gonna be unprepared. It's just not gonna keep them warm enough. I know that there was some electricity being set up, but it's still being set up. Uh, Sanitation is still an issue. The same at Kawagask. Kawagask is actually even bigger. There were Uh, 15,000 individuals at that camp when I was there. And I saw some of these latrines that had been dug where there wasn't proper oversight of the contractor. And so it wasn't dug deep enough and it's already starting to overfill. So there's, you know, I think that this is the nature of when you have such a huge influx and the agencies are trying to respond as rapidly as possible, but there's still gaps and still things that aren't quite coordinated yet. And uh, you said agencies. Can you just tell us more background about what agencies are involved? Is it, are you talking about international agencies? Is the government, the local government involved, nonprofits? Who, who is there? Of course, you always have the usual suspects. UNHCR, you know, a lot of the tents are being provided by UNHCR. And there are much better uh, canvas and stronger tents than you'll see the, some of these other makeshift tents are. So UNHCR is there uh, being able to provide those needs. UNICEF is there, um, particularly in trying to get the schools set up, also helping with water and sanitation. Um, you have a World Food Program. Uh, you also have local agencies. Um, there's a Barzani Foundation that's providing a lot of bread to, and, and other food items. Um, you have agencies like International Rescue Committee, uh, Save the Children, uh, Doctors Without Borders, setting up you know, medical um, hospitals uh, to treat um, refugees in the camps. Uh, at Domiz, they actually have a medical center that's running 24-7, which is excellent. And, you know, it's needed because you actually have quite a number of women who are pregnant. I think the estimate right now is that there's two to three uh, children being born in the camp or by bo- uh, residents in the camp 
um, each day. Wow. Um, so you definitely have a lot of needs, maternal, you know, health needs. And who, who are the doctors working at the center? Did you get a sense? Uh, well, in Domi's, uh, Doctors Without Borders mm-hmm. has have medical personnel there. I know that the government is also providing some assistance, so you also see um, families, you know, a lot of the children that are being born, they're not being born there at the medical facility in the camp. They're actually going to area hospitals. Okay. Um, so that's critical to keep in mind. One thing I will say with all of these agencies um, that are clearly present doing good work, um, the humanitarian appeal to meet the needs of all of this Syrian refugees, and this is, you know, just a small number of the larger picture, um, is still only 50% funded. And we're now like into, we're going into October, and it's still only 50% funded for this year. Um, so I think that also explains some of the, the gaps in providing for the needs is that there are real funding issues. And the, these host governments can respond to a certain extent, but the international community also has to share the burden. And that 50% figure, does that reflect the, the larger Syrian crisis? You're talking about the, all the neighboring countries of Syria. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're talking about more than 6 million Syrians who have been displaced by violence, uh, many of them, of course, staying within Syria, but well over 2 million who have fled abroad. And um, as I said before, half that population are children. Mm-hmm. And how many of those refugees have fled into northern Iraq? Over 200,000 at this point, and that's, I'm estimating that. Um, I know I've seen figures of 150,000, but again, there's a difference between registrations and actual numbers, and I actually think the estimate is closer to 200,000. And the majority of them who have fled to Iraq, many of them are coming from the Kurdish areas of Syria, and they're fleeing directly into the Kurdistan region of Iraq in particular. Um, So that's, you know, we're talking about three governorates out of 18 governorates that are handling a large influx. So EPIC's work focuses on youth who are residing in Iraq, in the country Mm -hmm. Iraq. Is there any um, plan or hope to involve uh, some Syrian refugees who come from the youth population? I I definitely see an opportunity. I mean, our our focus is always going to be about uh, building peace and taking humanitarian action within Iraq. But we, you know, we can't ignore any vulnerable population, and Syrian refugees are one of the vulnerable populations currently in Iraq. Um, I think, unfortunately, there's no end in sight with the violence in Syria. So we might find that some of these families will be will will uh, be looking at rebuilding their lives within Iraq, and we hope that there'll be opportunities to do so. I mean, Iraq is has wealth; it's developing. The economy is is um, really booming in the in the northern Iraq and the rest of Iraq. So I do think that there's plenty of room to create enough opportunities for everybody. What was it like to talk to these residents of these camps? I mean, on the one hand, it was overwhelming because just walking through the camp, meeting with these families and and residents, you you get a sense of what it must be like. You know, I'm I'm a new father. I have a a three-year-old and... um, I'm very sensitive to what affects my child. Mm -hmm. And I was meeting with families that would have, you know, young, young children, um, sometimes even five or seven children. And to imagine that for those children, their world, first of all, completely changed with the onset of violence Mm -hmm. um, and uncertainties and, you know, schools closing and, uh, you know, scarcity of food and everything that was affecting their lives before they left. But then having to leave their homes, you know, their ancestral homes, you know, the history and and so many families and uh, friends and connections, community connections, to just be uprooted and then have to leave and travel to a whole nother country, a whole nother area that's so new and different and living out of a tent. I mean, it's really hard to imagine. It's, um, you know, and you see it sometimes with, uh, in talking with some of the families. But on the other hand, also, there's this tremendous, this tremendous resilience that I would find with some of the families and residents. I'd talk with a matriarch of a family where, you know, the the husband is possibly fighting or um, looking for work, you know, is, is not there. Um, and so she's left to uh, provide for her family as best that she can. Um, and, you know, just this, this uh, resiliency that would come through and 
um, determination to find a way to rebuild their lives, um, you know, with whatever is provided, um, w- with whatever little is provided. Um, I also w- found it inspiring to uh, meet with some of the refugees who had started to organize themselves. There's an organization among the refugee camps, chapters in many of the camps, mm-hmm. called the Syrian Civil Organization Vision, or Nahreen. Mm-hmm. And I was really impressed with the work that they're doing. I mean, it makes so much sense to start organizing themselves because you have communities that are uprooted and among them are doctors or teachers. And so they're, they're working to make that known, that information known um, to the different agencies that are serving the camp so that then individuals can continue their professions and serve their own uh, communities um, now, you know, dislocated in new lo- in lo- locations. Um, so that I think was was quite inspiring, and um, you know, it's it's the needs are tremendous. Um, you know, it can be overwhelming to imagine what it must be like for a family, and yet still, uh, agencies are are stepping up, and individuals uh, within those camps, the refugees themselves, are organizing themselves to meet those needs. And you know, it, I think it's just a matter of the international community. Uh, also being there with them and helping to share the burden. So in addition to Syrian refugees, of course, there are also a lot of vulnerable Iraqis. Um, More than 3 million Iraqis are still displaced, many of them within Iraq. Um, You also have 9 million uh, women who are vulnerable. Um, These are, whether they're widows, um, divorcees, female-headed households, Uh, you have millions of Iraqis, at least 3.5 million, who have uh, serious disabilities, either physical or mental. Um, you know, we many know the stories about the minefields of Iraq and how many individuals have lost limbs, not to mention the continued violence and bombings that, that result in a lot of casualties. Um, and in addition to that, there are also uh, Iraqis who, are, who belong to religious and ethnic minorities. Um, those are populations that need assistance it, and they also need support to ensure that they're able to access equal justice within the new Iraq. And during your trip to Iraq, what did you learn about steps being taken to uh, to work with these vulnerable pop- populations? Well, we um, had the honor of being able to participate in a USAID conference. Um, I was uh, invited to be one of the presenters, and this was a, a conference that's related to a USAID program called Access to Justice really impressive what they've been doing. I mean, it's a program that is about supporting Iraqi civil society, uh, legal associations, law schools, to be able to ensure that vulnerable Iraqis have access to equal justice. And um, I had the pleasure of being able to meet with some of these uh, civil society organizations, some of whom I've met with in the past or I've known of in the past, but I had a chance to meet and talk more and learn about what they were doing right now. And I'll just give you two quick examples. Um, One is an organization called uh, the acronym is IATO, and it stands for the Iraqi Alliance of Disability Organizations. And I had a chance to meet with uh, Kamil al farwachi and his colleagues. Um, what, what excited me about them, I mean, as you know, I'm myself, I'm a veteran. Right. Um, these are vets. These are, uh, you know, Iraqi vets that maybe uh, fought in the Iran-Iraq war, maybe even in the 91 Gulf War. They, heck, they might have been on the opposite side when I was uh, in the army. Um, and deployed there, um, or more recently with the Iraqi army. Um, there, when Bremer issued the decree that disbanded Iraq's military, uh, it also you affected- after the 2003 uh, Yeah, after invasion. the 2003 right. invasion. So okay. um, uh, Bremer, of course, was the um, head of the CPA, the Coalition Provisional Authority, that was established um, to oversee the transition. And he was only there for a year, and it's really amazing the damage that he's done. Um, One of which was a decree to disband Iraq's military. Well, that affected a lot of these vets who were receiving uh, what was, is basically we could characterize as um, uh, disability assistance um, for, you know, injuries that they sustained when they were in service. So this would include vets who served in the 1980s before, before their conflict with the United States. Yeah, precisely. So any anybody who had served in the Iraqi military who had lost a limb or um, sustained a serious injury where they needed assistance, 
uh, that was also disbanded. The whole military was disbanded. So um, these veterans organized themselves and started to form this organization to advocate on behalf of Iraqis with disabilities. And what impresses me about them is that they didn't just focus on veterans with disabilities. They are focusing on all Iraqis with disabilities. And they recently had the success of getting legislation passed. We're still looking into the details of that, but um, but what they told me is that um, the Iraq's parliament had passed legislation that will now provide assistance to people with disabilities. And they now recognize that the next battle to be fought is to make sure that that law is fully implemented and um, is applied to all people with disabilities. Yeah, that, that would be a big change, I think, for many, many individuals in Iraq. Yeah, absolutely. And so that, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you wanted to mention two organizations that you met. What was the other one yeah, that, so that, that inspired you? Yeah, so that's just one. I mean, th- th- so many inspired me, but I just wanted to give two examples. Right. So that's one organization. The other organization is uh, an organization that's based in Dohuk called uh, Voices of the Older People. And this is an organization that specifically focuses on helping uh, senior citizens, especially seniors that might have lost family members um, who would normally be there to be able to um, provide for their needs. Um, so we could we already know that, you know, a great example here in the United States would be organizations that um, do like Meals on Wheels, right. very similar type services. And they also recognize that elders have an important role that th- to play in society. Iraq um, in particular really does, there's a respect for elders. And so they also have some really interesting peace building initiatives that connects with the working with this, um, the senior community in Iraq. So those are just two examples of, I think, uh, civil society organizations that are doing some really incredible work. So this conference that you went to was sponsored by USAID. Um, you know, I've, I've heard some information that USAID won't be staying in Iraq very much longer. Did you learn anything about that while you were there? I, unfortunately, I mean, I've been hearing the same rumors and I was very interested to get to the bottom of it. And I had an opportunity to talk with USAID officials um, all the way up to the very senior levels. And I can sadly confirm that currently USAID is scheduled to leave Iraq in 2015. Um, I, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I mean, we were just, you know, talking about this conference and um, vulnerable Iraqis and the important work that some of these civil society organizations are doing. You know, on, on the plus side, Iraq is a country that has tremendous wealth. But as we heard in the previous podcast from Bilal Wahab, um, there is this whole issue of an oil curse that Iraq suffers from. And I think that will continue. One way of, or one remedy to that um, is to ensure that there is a robust and active civil society, independent media, that can all be pressing the government to be more accountable, um, to ensure that the wealth is truly shared by all Iraqis, um, to ensure that there's equal justice for all. You're not going to have that if those partnerships end. You're not going to have that if the international community pulls up their stakes and leaves. You can't just assume that all of that is going to naturally come about. Um, there's these important civil society organizations that will literally cease to exist because if there isn't some ongoing support for them. Right, they'll lose funding. Absolutely, and and I don't think it's in our best interest. I mean, from a U.S. perspective, somebody needs to explain to me how it's in our best interest for, for example, the U.S. to cease funding and partnerships with Iraqi universities and schools. Because, you know, these, these headmasters and um, school officials, uh, they are looking around. They, they are keenly interested in the American model of education. They're keenly interested in technical assistance and support with developing curriculums. Well, if we leave, you know, the uh, Saudis are there, the Iranians are there, they're offering all kinds of assistance. You know, so are we going to just basically leave, leave it to other countries in the region um, to provide that kind of assistance when we're already seeing the results of, you know, the, the kind of um, dynamics within the region being played out in Syria. I mean, I don't think that's in our best interest. I think that, that the international community, that the United States, um, that we need to continue to be engaged in playing a role. I'm not saying that there's no role for other countries to also be providing assistance, but I think for the U.S. to just leave, pick up, pull up stakes and leave um, is a horrible idea. Um, we have a moral obligation to Iraqis who have been affected by the war, um, pe- Iraqis who still are displaced by violence, um, and we also have, I think, a strong interest in providing the kinds of supports that leads 
uh, to a more peaceful, prosperous future for all Iraqis. So you, you seem to you did a lot in Iraq. How many days were you there? That's a good question. I, I mean, it's so funny. I can't even remember the exact number. I know it was at least 10 days. 10 um, days. Okay, so what else did you do during your visit? So I had an opportunity to meet with some really exceptional individuals. I mean, not just, you know, meeting with educators and meeting with the university and some of these officials, but uh, meeting with young people uh, who are entrepreneurs, like a young gentleman, Mohammed Salah, um, who started Weva. And it's a, it's an agency that's providing um, consulting services on a whole range of media, but also providing analysis and objective analysis, which is really nice to see in Iraq. Um, you know, he's, he's uh, at basically um, providing services for all of these different, whether it's businesses or NGOs that need information about the security conditions, um, about political conditions, about what to expect, um, and you know, I, I mean, I'm just I always get excited when I when I see some of the these um, startups uh, that are that are happening. Um, also, when I was there, there was actually there's an organization that has been helping to support youth entrepreneurs. Um, they call them startups. So they had a startup Baghdad, which was highly successful. They had a startup Erbil in the city of Erbil and a startup in uh, Suleimani. And talking, I didn't get a chance to actually see it, but from talking with colleagues, I was very impressed at how well attended and how, you know, the level of participation, the quality of participation that occurred, um, not just with youth uh, who are trying to start their own businesses or their own agencies, um, but also the level of involvement by government officials that are clearly wanting to do more to invest in those young people. It sounds like you saw a lot when you were in Iraq, um, the full spectrum of many challenges that are still facing Iraq, but um, some great examples of very positive change on the ground and some very positive work being done. It's great to, to hear from you in the, in the office. Thanks for sitting yeah. down with me. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. Now to David and Leslie with our special guest interview with Kyle Long. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Slater, and I'm joined by Leslie Harkins. And today we're going to be interviewing Kyle Long. And he is the Director of Communications and Institutional Development at the American University of Iraqi Suleimani. Kyle, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, David. Thanks, Leslie. Happy to be here. Kyle, could you give us a brief introduction of yourself? Sure. As you pointed out, I'm the Director of Communications and Institutional Development at the American University of Iraq Suleimani. I've been there for three years now, going on my fourth year when I go back in a couple of weeks. And I was working in higher education associations uh, before I found my way out to Iraq. I was trying to do some work that would strengthen university governance and assessment of student learning outcomes in higher education in the United States. And then by uh, accident and circumstances, found my way out into Iraq. So you weren't specifically looking for a, a job out in Iraq? I wasn't specifically looking for a job out in Iraq, which separates me a little bit from some of my colleagues who are sort of drawn to the place for all sorts of reasons, but, but because it is Iraq. I was mostly interested in the opportunity to build a university, which mm -hmm. is such a, a rare thing to do nowadays. You know, my alma mater was founded in the year 1832, and a lot of universities in the United States are founded in the 1800s, early 1900s, and there are a lot of ed tech companies now, and there are opportunities to start new educational ventures, but nothing like a brick and mortar university, and, or in our case, Marble University, but that's what really drew me out there was the opportunity to build a university. Okay, and I'm sure you'd heard about Iraq before. Were you worried about the danger? <laughs> I'd heard of Iraq before. I guess I was just so full of adrenaline. That wasn't really a factor for me. I mean, I guess danger was part of the allure. I can say you know, confidently now that there's very little danger in the work that I do. I'm not trying to say that there's not the prospect of danger given our location, but you know, we're based in the, the Kurdistan region in the north of Iraq and it is uh, relatively safe compared to other parts of Iraq and, and then Iraq's neighbors. Okay, and you, you say that the university is located in Suleimani. Would you be able to describe Suleimani for us? What, sure. what does this area look like? Sure. Uh, Suleimani is a beautiful city. 
in, in the northern part uh, of Iraq, in the Kurdistan region. It's about 40 miles west of the border with Iran, in the southern part of the Kurdistan region. And it's a city of about a million people. It's situated in a valley uh, between two mountain ranges. And it is a rather temperate climate, which is, I guess I hesitate to say that right now, uh, because last reports were that it was like 110 degrees there today. Um, oh, wow. But in the winter, it snows. Mm -hmm. For much of the year, it's green. Uh, it's a really pretty place. And uh, How long do the seasons last? Is the summer, does it snow? The summer is, is long. It starts really picking up in, in mid-May and then lasting through September, October. The fall and spring are, are shorter than the summer and the winter, but they're the prettiest times of the year. It snows in the winter, and it doesn't, doesn't stick too much, but I've had some really fun experiences playing soccer in the snow in Suleimani. And um, as you go farther up north into the mountains, it can be just stunningly pretty and much more reminiscent of Colorado than, than probably many of the images that uh, Americans or your listeners would have in mind when thinking of Iraq. Wow. I, would, I think I would like to go there one day. <laughs> yeah. you, you've sold you're me on going to Suleimani. You're welcome anytime. Okay, so could you, could you tell us a little bit about AUIS? It's kind of renowned for being a Western-style institution, and that's kind of unique in Iraq. Could you just kind of explain what that means? Sure. And, and I'm happy to hear that we are a renowned university. It makes me feel like I'm doing my job, which is good. But uh, AUIS was founded in 2007 by a group of very forward-thinking Iraqis who were looking to emulate some of the successes of other American-style universities in the Middle East, like the American University of Beirut, the American University of Cairo, and, uh, and provide an alternative to a style of education that had been dominant in, in the Middle East and, and still is to this day, um, which is based on a kind of philosophy of education that is about putting information into people rather than drawing ideas out of them. <laughs> and uh, so the idea was that uh, we would provide a liberal arts uh, education for Iraqis and all Iraqis, not just those based in the Kurdistan region, but from all of Iraq's provinces um, to come and, and get an American-style education. So you said it was founded in 2007. Kind of what is its story? Who founded it and, and why and how have you seen it develop since sure. the beginning? Like I said, I've been there since 2010. Uh, so I wasn't there in the beginning. But it's um, a pretty well-known fact that this was the brainchild of, of our founder and, and current chairman, Barham Sala, and a number of other uh, supporters um, from uh, the Kurdistan region and uh, wider Iraq. It was also at the beginning founded on the on the promise of support from the United States government as well. So there were a lot of stakeholders early on. It's grown from when we started uh, on a, in a temporary campus um, with cabins for classrooms uh, that were portable and to now a 418-acre campus that has uh, $176 million worth of beautiful buildings uh, in a very, very short period of time. And it's been very rewarding to, to see the growth, and not only in the physical structure, but to see the growth in the students, too. Um, when we moved from uh, our original campus, and I'm putting campus in air quotes because it was it was really just a temporary structure to our beautiful facilities today. You could really see the students take ownership over the university mm -hmm. finally. It was really neat in the, in the fall of 2011 when we moved to our new campus to see the kids' eyes light up and say, aha, this is it. This is what an American university is supposed to look like. So Iraq's universities used to be considered some of the best in the region. Um, what is the current state of higher education in Iraq? Also, what role, if any, are Iraqi in universities playing in carrying out primary research and contributing to scientific advancement and innovation in Iraq? You're right. Um, for, for a long time, Iraq's universities were, were the pride of the Middle East. They were, I mean, uh, they were, especially in Baghdad, I mean, Iraq has a long, long history of, or what is now modern Iraq, has uh, a long history of contributing to, to learning worldwide, uh, going back 
to the House of Wisdom in, in the 8th century. You know, Iraq was always, or excuse me, Baghdad traditionally had always been a hub of learning in the Middle East. And so that legacy continued well into the 20th century. But after the Ba'ath regime took over, the universities started to turn inward and they closed themselves off from, from much of, of the wider, not only Middle East, but the rest of the world. And so academics were isolated and they didn't have access to networks, which means they didn't have access to contemporary scholarship. And when that happens, when your professors don't have the ability to engage the wider world, not a whole lot of good learning can take place. And consequently, the state of Iraqi universities began to deteriorate. And we're only just now opening back up to to the wider world. After 2003, Iraq's universities uh, finally were able to uh, re-engage these networks that, that had been lost. And, you know, the Institute of International Education has done a really good work in patriating Iraqis, Iraqi academics back into the country and reintroducing Iraqi academics to their wider professional networks. And so that will assist in the in the regeneration of these Iraqi universities. So what I know that you mentioned that the AUIS kind of draw has a poll for Iraqis around the country. But what kind of students, if you can like kind of pinpoint, does AUIS attract and, and how is AUIS helping to shape the next generation of Iraqi leaders? Sure. AUIS very simply wants to be the university of choice in Iraq. We want the best students regardless of financial situation, um, regardless of, of ethnicity or, or sect or tribe or any other common demographic marker. We want the best students. At present, the student body is overwhelmingly Kurdish. Um, there are um, almost 80% of our students are Kurdish, 15% are Arab, and then another 5% are ethnic minorities, um, ethnic and religious minorities, Syrian Christians, Yazidis, um, Turkmen. We have a few Iranian and, and Turkish students. But we would like to be a national university. Uh, we uh, draw pretty well from Baghdad at present, and we have a very, very sizable online following of Baghdadis. Um, and so we're, we're anticipating more growth uh, from the south. As to the second part of your question about universities contributing to research and scientific achievements, I'd go back to what I said earlier about the state of Iraqi universities and having been cut off from uh, wider networks um, and, and contemporary scholarship. I think that there's a great interest on the part of the ministries of higher education in both the Kurdistan regional government and the, and the central government to contributing to uh, global scholarship. And so I wouldn't know how to comment at present on how successful that is, but I can see a renewed interest in it. Um, and so uh, these ministries are devoting resources to this, but I, uh, it'll, only time will tell how successful I think they'll be in, in terms of research. So can, can you share any stories about um, students you've gotten to know and about how AUIS has impacted their lives? Sure. You know, the great part about working at a small university, I mean, let alone AUIS, but working at any small university is the opportunity to get to know your students because um, we're doing a lot of neat things at the institutional level, but working one-on-one -on -one with students is uh, some of the most rewarding uh, experiences you can have. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to coach both the men's basketball team at AUIS and teach English 101. Uh, for a few semesters. And so I've gotten to know students really well. But I guess one story I'd like to tell is about a student that I neither coached nor taught, is a young woman who's the editor of our student newspaper. Um, uh, AUIS has uh, an independent student newspaper um, that is written entirely in English. And young woman who is from Erbil and um, uh, speaks Turkish, Arabic, Kurdish, and English, and she is doing a phenomenal job as editor of, of the student newspaper and holding 
the administration and the faculty accountable for things that they feel like they're being shortchanged on. It's the same kind of thing that you'd see at any American university where, where you're at maybe at BU, or is it BU or BC? Yeah, BU. BU. That I'm sure the student newspaper at BU tries to hold the administration and the faculty accountable exactly. for things that they don't like. Well, this sort of thing doesn't occur um, at, at other universities in Iraq. And so at the same time, as a member of the administration, it's a bit of a thorn in my side, <laughs> but I'm so proud of her uh, for for doing this really good reporting. And she's doing such a good job that she got an internship at the Iraq Oil Report this summer and is now writing uh, major stories for for this really important publication that deals with the oil and gas sector in Iraq. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's young women like Dina who are going to uh, make the most of an American-style education and all of the uh, sort of co-curricular uh, and extracurricular activities that come along with it and really make an American-style education worth it. So beyond the classroom, what are some things that are happening at AUIS that gives you hope um, for Rex Future? So things that are happening at AUIS outside of the classroom? Well, one of the things is the uh, new Institute for Regional and International Studies at AUIS. Uh, We launched IRIS um, in March of this past year at the inaugural Suleimani Forum. And um, the Suleimani Forum is an event that will be hosted at AUIS every year um, that brings together policy makers and policy implementers, academics, journalists, politicians from Iraq, the Middle East, and the wider world to have conversations about issues that really matter in the Middle East but don't often get a public forum within the country. And, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's a unique and valuable opportunity for Iraq uh, to be able to have a venue and an event like this that can bring people together. In March, we had the theme of the conference, two-day conference, was the changing geopolitics of the Middle East. And we brought together Hoshar Zabari, the, the foreign minister of Iraq, Salmeh Khalilzad, former ambassador to Iraq, Afghanistan, and the United Nations. Um, we had Max Rodenbeck from The Economist. Uh, we had some important folks from Chatham House and from the University of Texas, Austin. Um, and uh, we had activists from Egypt and Tunisia. And it was just a great event. And uh, we're going to be doing this every year in March. And so I think that that kind of thing gives me hope, which is a sort of a co-curricular, extracurricular activity, things that happen at the university that get not only our students, but the community and researchers and academics and journalists and politicians from throughout the region involved with AUIS um, in, in talking about things that matter in a transparent way. And for this forum, uh, what, what were some of the examples of the topics for discussion? For instance, were, it, were they only Iraqi related or were they regional? Oh, no, 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 no. All sorts of... Um, we had um, we, uh, a panel on women leaders of the Middle East. Um, we had a panel on the, the oil dimension writ large, not just um, uh, Iraq-focused. We had a panel on the Kurdish question, um, which is not only an Iraqi issue. As you know, it's it's also an issue in Iran and in Syria. Right, the Turkey, diaspora. Exactly. Um, and so we, we discussed issues that matter throughout the Middle East, as well as what's going on in Iraq. We are it would be foolish to try to think about ourselves uh, disconnected from from our environment. So we do want to talk about issues that matter um, directly geographically, but also, you know, considering Iraq's wider borders uh, as well. Um, it was it was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, there's a website, SuleimaniForum.com, where you can find out more information about last year's forum, watch the videos, um, but then also see what's. Uh, uh, going to happen for for next year's forum as well. And when does next year's forum happen? uh, Date hasn't yet been set, but it likely will occur in March 2014. Thank you. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm really happy to hear those those things are happening where people can discuss the issues. It's really unique. I mean, this is a, we, we are fortunate to be positioned 
in a place like like Kurdistan, like Iraqi Kurdistan, that it is a tolerant, tolerant, welcoming environment, we could conceivably get Israelis and Iranians on a stage together, Kurds and Arabs on a stage together, you know, uh, Syrians and Turks on a stage together. Um, and that's one of the few places, I think, in the Middle East or even the world where this kind of thing can happen. So we're very proud of it. That's definitely something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. So you previously mentioned that Barham Saleh was a founder That's of correct. the uh, American University in Suleimani. Tell us a little bit about him and exactly what his story is. Sure. Barham is a man of incredible energy and, and vision. And um, he's, a, he's a Kurdish politician who... Um, in the 90s was very involved with the efforts to liberate um, Kurdistan and Iraq from the dictators, Saddam Hussein. Um, he was the Kurdistan regional government's representative to the United States at that time. Um, he has been a major player in, in Kurdish uh, politics as, as prime minister and, and has been a major player in Iraqi politics as former Deputy Prime Minister, um, and I can only see his, his stock rising. Why would you say that Iraq is important for Americans? To well, I mean, I guess I could answer that in two ways. I mean, you can answer it from a perspective of an American who, who hasn't lived in Iraq either. I mean, Iraq is important for many reasons, not the least of which is that Iraq is OPEC's second leading producer of oil, has the fifth largest proven oil reserves in the world. Um, that makes Iraq an important country, no matter what. It also, right now, it's geographically important. Iraq is surrounded right now by countries that are going through some significant changes. The obvious example is, is Syria. And the, the Syrian and Iraqi theaters are, are sort of merging. And there are I think by last count, 160,000 Syrian refugees in Iraq right now. And Iraq's relationship with Iran matters a lot to Americans, but then across the Middle East as well. So I think that Americans can easily get exhausted by Iraq. It's been, it's been in, uh, something that Iraq has been in American news since Desert Storm, um, since the Gulf War. There was a period in the 90s where we probably didn't hear as much as we should have about what was going on. Uh, but then from over the past 10 years anyway, it's been almost nonstop. And I can imagine why Americans can feel a bit worn out by Iraq. But it's still fiercely, fiercely important to American interests. It is, with, with Turkey to the north and Turkey becoming more and more of an economic powerhouse in the Middle East and, and, and having more and more business interests in the Kurdistan region, especially. And then with Syria and, and Iran on opposite sides, and then with Saudi Arabia to, to the south, Iraq has very important neighbors, which makes Iraq itself, I think, by the transitive property, uh, essential to trying to sort out all the other issues that are going on in the Middle East. Thank you very much, Kyle, for uh, all your answers and for joining us today. Well, you both are welcome to, to come to Slavani at any time, and uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. Now we're going to tune into an excerpt with Professor Bilal Wahab on his experiences with going back to Iraq. So you've now taught at American University of Iraq, Slovenia, for about a year. How has your experience been returning to Iraq after being in the United States for some of your postgraduate education and returning as an educator? Uh, it has actually been a very rewarding experience. Um, American University of Iraq Soleimani has given me an opportunity to, to teach topics that I'm familiar with, uh, topics that I, I like to teach uh, in English uh, to you know a group of young and very energetic students that come from all over Iraq. Um, the second largest group of students at the American University of Iraq Soleimani actually come from Baghdad. So I have a, every, every class that I have, I have taught has been, has been very, very diverse. Diverse, you know, in terms of ethnicity, 
in terms of race, in terms of religion and sect. It's a, the, the university is a liberal arts school. Classes are conducted fully in English. Uh, we have more than 40 faculty who come from different parts of the world. Unlike the restrictive nature of Iraq's, you know, dated higher education system, uh, the American University of Iraq allows for creativity, allows for, uh, you know, there is the entrepreneurial spirit of responding to what is needed in the market, what's needed in the government. So, um, Classes uh, are designed according to, uh, on, a, on a needs base. Um, for example, I designed a course on the political economy of oil states, a class that did not exist before. You have a conversation with the chair, with the university president. This is something, you know, important and you have a debate about it and there is room to create a course. This summer, for example, we had uh, a visiting professor who taught a course on women leadership. So there are these opportunities that, unfortunately, the Iraqi, you know, education system is very rigid and does not allow for. So our students are in for a treat. They get um, to uh, to choose their own major, which is also one of the distinctive features of the American University of Iraq uh, in Soleimani. Because, again, the Iraqi higher education system does not allow students to choose their major. You know, it's, it's the high school uh, average that you get basically decides what college and what major you go into. Our students tend to choose their majors, which you know gives them the flexibility of choosing their own future. Uh, we have graduated two classes so far. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, many of them found it easy to find jobs in both government, but mainly the private sector. Great. And AUIS, like you mentioned, is, is known for being an inclusive American-style institution. How do you think this is helping to shape the next generation of Iraqi leaders? Oh, absolutely. That's, that's actually the goal of the university, uh, to uh, educate uh, the next generation of leaders. Because what we teach the students, we teach them critical thinking. We teach them to, uh, to take learning as a, as a lifelong adventure rather than just a degree that they can hang on the wall. Uh, we teach them to weigh and evaluate different ideas and opinions and develop their own informed um, opinions based on previous knowledge and based on, on, on reading and critical thinking. We try to provide them, of course you cannot teach everything at the university, so what we try to provide them with is the, the theoretical framework as well as the tools and methodologies for our students to be able to adapt to whatever job opportunities that come afterwards. That's why our students find it easier to go and work for, uh, let's say, uh, international companies or even domestic companies. We do teach skills uh, such as good writing, communication, some number crunching, especially at our business department. But uh, our main value is to allow the students the freedom to choose their own future, to shape their own future and to give them the chance and the opportunity to interact with professors and to critically assess and analyze the, the information that we throw at them. So we try to create leaders who can think for themselves and uh, people who, who learn something will also learn how to learn. listeners in the D.C. area, there's a conference coming up on Thursday, October 3rd at the George Washington University titled The Encounter, Americans, Iraqis, and a Decade of War, which is organized by Professor Mark Lynch. We're really excited to attend and we'll be there live tweeting. For a link to the registration, check out our Facebook page. But before we go, we'd like to take a moment to respond to some of our listeners. My name is Shanaz and my colleague Mary and I will be listening to your questions and comments. Mary, what have our listeners been asking? Well, one of our listeners on iTunes asks, perhaps the next episode could include a piece explaining the role of the Iraqi president. What exactly are the president's duties compared to the prime minister? Well, that's a, a difficult question, Shanaz. In Iraq, the president, Jalal Talabani, serves as the head of state, which means that he has the power to do things like ratify treaties and laws that have been passed by the Council of Representatives, veto legislation, and issue presidential decrees. 
The President can also issue pardons at the recommendation of the Prime Minister and serves as the higher command for ceremonial and honorary purposes. So it sounds like the President has some of the same powers as our President in the United States. Yeah, some of them. On the other hand, the Prime Minister, Nuri al-Maliki, is the direct executive authority responsible for the general policy of the state. He directs the Council of Ministers, and he's also the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. So the Council of Ministers, is that similar to our cabinet here in the U.S.? That's probably the closest parallel. So it sounds like the Prime Minister and the President split the powers of the executive branch, but the Prime Minister has more of the powers. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds about right. Do you have any other comments, Mary? Yes, a listener by the handle Iraqi Peacenik, which uh, I love that handle, um, says that he or she is very excited to stumble across a podcast dedicated to Iraq, the urgency of current developments, and interesting topics about the country's rich cultural diversity and history. Thank you. We're just as excited to continue bringing more news, ideas, and conversations about Iraq to you. I would agree. This has been Iraq Matters, an epic podcast of news, ideas, and conversations about Iraq. Thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to get involved or have any questions or comments that we can address in our next podcast, please email us at iraqmatters at yahoo.com. You can also comment on our Facebook page or send us a tweet at Enabling Peace. We'd like to thank our special guest, Kyle Long from AUIS. Our theme music is Falkanachal by Nazim Al-Ghazali. And our transitional music is Rahim al Hajj's title track, The Second Baghdad. You can subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This is Shana's Waze reminding you and friends around the world that Iraq matters.